Think about that. Dogs don't get prostate cancer. They don't die from it. Maybe they get it. Who knows? We haven't biopsied them. It is plausible that our cult of biopsying prostates has done two things. Expand the perception of the disease being common because after all, we're finding, we're digging it out of the gland, these atypical dormant cells that should be left alone, in my opinion. And we're spreading them around. So that as we dig and we dig and we spread and they get metastatic cancer, we create a pathological tsunami that invites us to treat it. The question arises, do any mammals besides humans get prostate cancer? More specifically, how about dogs? Do they get prostate cancer? I mean, they have a prostate. They are mammals. They have the same type of reproductive anatomy that we have, and they live with us. They breathe our air. They drink our water. They eat our food, more or less, all coming from the same place. In fact, it's exceedingly rare for dogs to ever get prostate cancer, which led me to research other mammal species. How about great apes, my nearest cousins? Nope, they don't get it. Pretty rare, even apes in captivity. So the idea that it is utterly unique to human beings and no other mammalian species gets this disease raises some significant questions. Why? What's the difference? I understand. I understand there are differences between Homo sapiens and the other species, but nevertheless, a profound disparity between species and prostate cancer. Enormous disparity. An interesting fact is that dolphins have never been known to get prostate cancer, ever. And they've actually done autopsies on dolphins looking for it. Couldn't find a thing. I don't know what they're doing, but boy, we better figure it out and apply some to us. You know, maybe there is an X factor. One of my theories about how to go about looking for cancer is to look for where it's not and figure out why not. This is a problem. It highlights the historical issues regarding prostate cancer. Let's go back in time. Let's go back to 1853. Dr. John Adams, a surgeon, did one of the first prostatectomies on a man with prostate cancer. And at the time, he described this as an exceedingly rare disease. That wasn't that long ago, folks, 1853, pretty recent history. How about in the turn of the century, 1900, 1910, prostate cancer hardly listed on the leading causes of death. In fact, it didn't crack the top 10. Now I get it. You know, back then people died younger. The germ theory hadn't been fully developed. They died of infections. Nevertheless, prostate cancer was a rare phenomenon. Is it possible when you put all these pieces together that prostate cancer, now let's be specific here. I'm talking about metastatic prostate cancer that takes men's lives that causes misery, almost as much misery as the treatment they impose on you while they're contemplating how to help you. The idea that we actually are creating metastatic cancer, expanding its footprint, making men more likely to die from prostate cancer needs to be considered. Think for a moment. When a surgeon says, well, there is no evidence that Prostate biopsies spread cancer. It's technically true. A little cute. It's a little cute because they've never looked. There's never been research to determine what would happen if we didn't stick needles into that gland. So, you know, folks, I advocate for never biopsying a prostate ever. It makes no sense. You're stirring up the cancer, spreading it. And even if it comes back negative, you're not out of the woods because they could have missed it. And the surgeons will tell you that. Well, you know, you should probably repeat the biopsy again. And it wasn't, the hell no. How about never? All right, so how about this study? How about if we took all the dogs out there above the age of whatever a dog year is that equals to 60. I forgot that math, was it seven, eight years? You get the point. You took old dogs and you took, let's say a hundred of them and you subjected a hundred old dogs to prostate biopsies. 
and you compare them to 100 old dogs matched for age and species without a biopsy. And then you wait and watch and you see what happens. Are the biopsy dogs going to be more likely to die from prostate cancer? Will they be the same? How much cancer will they find by digging into a gland of an otherwise totally healthy, happy, tail wagging, food eating, leg humping dog? How much are they helping that animal? Now, as I mentioned this thought, I hope you recoil in horror. How could they do that to those cute little dogs? They are so happy. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just enjoying being a dog. And you're going to wedge this thing into the... Well, that's just cruel and unusual. I agree. And it's cruel and unusual, folks, to do it to humans. When there's no strong evidence of any benefit regarding your survival and there's a rational reason, a plausible basis to hypothesize that you're more likely to die from metastatic cancer if that biopsy is performed than if it is not performed. And the more you do it, then mathematically speaking, the more likely those odds. You think this is made up, it is not. There's evidence in the medical literature regarding other forms of cancer that were preceded by biopsies. There was a study looking at uh, breast cancer. And in this study, women had early stage, very suspicious looking, diagnostically supported mammograms. Very likely to be cancer. So much so that half the women in the study went directly to a lumpectomy, no biopsy was done. The other half did the traditional biopsy first. The outcome, the women who had no biopsy had a significantly lower rate of metastatic breast cancer. Evidence of the hypothesis. Now think about that. Think about if you, they have an ominous looking MRI of the prostate, a pyrides of five nodules pressing up against the capsule. They have a PSA level that is elevated but they feel good, no symptom. We do a biopsy. Suppose a biopsy comes back negative. Nobody's gonna believe it. The findings are too ominous to just be passive. You could make an argument. Nope, in fact, I will make the argument that it's more logical to go directly to a prostate gland removal than to get the biopsy first. If and only if you have an ominous looking prostate and you're willing to accept the potential consequences, which we've spoken of here before. And those consequences could be devastating, life-altering. But if there's any value to be had from a prostatectomy, then it makes more sense to avoid the biopsy first. Now, to the extent that would be a consideration, you have to apply the protocol that I've developed or something very much like it. Now, I just do my protocol. So we're researching this. It's an ongoing cohort. We're going to get this answer for you people. And the answer is going to be, can we treat this cancer in a manner that doesn't sacrifice masculine virility, in a manner that doesn't expose you to leaking urine, impotence, infection, in a manner that doesn't lead you down the path to castration? I believe that answer is going to show us that this safe approach is equal to, if not better than what's out there now. That's a bold statement. And it brings to mind Dr. Semmelweis. Dr. Semmelweis, he's one of my medical heroes. It was uh, in the 1800s, mid 1800s, a Hungarian physician took note that when doctors of that era delivered babies, the mothers had a death rate between 10 and 18% from fever. When the midwife delivered the baby, the mortality rate was 2%. So this is before the germ theory had been developed. Dr. Semmelweis was a really astute observer. He's my hero. I count myself as one of those people. And when he saw that, he hypothesized, hey guys, something's happening here. Because the doctors back then would go dissect a cadaver, then with their grudgy hands go deliver a baby. No glove, no hand washing. They didn't know about germs. Semmelweis didn't know about germs either. He just was an intellectual man with logical extension. And he said, hey, let's wash our hands. So he implemented that. And the mortality rate dropped from 10 to 18% down to 2%. 
Semmelweis became a Nobel laureate. He was championed. He became head of the... No, none of that occurred. He was damned. He was ostracized. The medical establishment was horrified that he would have the termidity to suggest that they might actually be harming their patients. He was banished from the hospital, banished from the country. He died alone, broke, a broken man. Maybe I shouldn't make him a hero. <laughs> but this is what happens when you're up against an established dogma. And that's what intellectual medicine is facing. We don't welcome conflict, nor do we shy away from it. The conflict is really on an intellectual plane. And with that thought in mind, then everybody's on the same side. We all want the same thing. I want what you want, an abundant life full of great health and vitality, punctuated by joy and ending quickly at a very advanced age. Now we're talking what is an advanced age. See, that ties into the whole equation, doesn't it? Because if they're calculating what to do for you, they're also calculating, without telling you this, how long you're going to live. And if they think, well, this dude's going to die at 85, then all of the calculations built around that number. I say, forget that, guys. We're aiming at 100 plus. And that's not fantasy. That is science and medicine in action at the cutting edge. I'll be sharing more details of that with you. In fact, we'll go back to the dogs for that. But for now, think about that. Dogs don't get prostate cancer. They don't die from it. Maybe they get it. Who knows? We haven't biopsied them. It is plausible that our cult of biopsying prostates has done two things. Expand the perception of the disease being common because, after all, we're finding, we're digging it out of the gland, these atypical dormant cells that should be left alone, in my opinion. And we're spreading them around so that as we dig and we dig and we spread and they get metastatic cancer, we create a pathological tsunami that invites us to treat it with ever more expensive, sophisticated, patented drugs. You know where I'm going. Well, listen, guys, thanks for hanging with me and uh, welcome you into the prostate protocol community. It's open to everybody. You don't need to be my patient. That's where uh, we'll be sharing recipes on what to eat, tips about what supplements to use, and just general support. So thanks. Thanks for being part of the podcast. Look forward to the next time we get to be together. Bye now.